How's it going, everyone? Welcome to the third episode of Elasmocast. Today, we have a very special guest, one of the most prolific modern Paleozoic and other animal um, paleontologists. Welcome, J.P. Hodnett. And today, we're going to be talking about a recent publication that he that you were a co-author on, or not co-author, you were the lead author on it, and it's it's some exciting stuff. So real quick, JP, before we get started, uh, let's hear a little bit of like how you got into paleontology, what got you into this stuff, and and just some background. Okay, cool. Well, for those who don't know, uh, my name is JP Hodnett. I am a paleontologist, a uh, government paleontologist, if you really want to get more detailed. Uh, for two uh, government bodies, I'm the paleontologist for the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission. Uh, which is a local county uh, unit that does, you know, parks and planning uh, for Prince George's and Montgomery County in Maryland. And I run a site called uh, Dinosaur Park, which we have early Cretaceous uh, dinosaur fossils and other fossils uh, going back 150 million years. And then I also split my time and help out with the National Park Service's uh, paleontology program. And with that job, I get to be sent all over the country, basically, uh, uh, documenting uh, fossil resources from various different park units, uh, you know, for the National Park Service. And one of my big projects is uh, Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. So how did I get started with all this? Uh, well, I've always been just kind of a, a paleo geek ever since I was a really, really little kid. Um, I always wanted to be a paleontologist since, you know, at least I was since I was five, maybe before that. And uh, it was just always kind of like my career goal. Um, however, um, sharks were not on my radar until much later. When I was a young kid, of course, mo like most people, probably people who started off in paleontology, dinosaurs were like the thing. I really wanted to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And um, I grew up in Arizona, uh, specifically in Tucson. And when I was a kid, I thought Arizona had nothing really to offer in terms of paleontology. And really, I was super wrong about that because uh, I was thought, you know, hey, you, if you want to find dinosaurs, you got to go like, like Wyoming, Montana and Colorado and places like that. Um, however, when I got into high school, uh, I wound up starting off being coming a volunteer at the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. And they were in the process of preparing uh, what is now the state dinosaur of Arizona, uh, Sonorosaurus thompsoni. And so my experience being a volunteer with them really opened up my eyes in terms of what Arizona had in terms of a paleontology fossil record. It was, it was a, it's immense. It's fantastic. So, um, but as a byproduct of that, I started actually getting into fossil mammals really heavily. And so uh, right about time I was about to end my senior year, um, in high school, uh, I met up with uh, Dr. Jim Mead, who is now retired uh, paleontologist, but um, he was a he's a world renowned Pleistocene paleontologist. So I really got heavily into mammals with him, particularly interested in studying mammalian carnivores like cats and dogs. And so originally, that's what I was, you know, pushing on working and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, I was working on a couple projects uh, during my undergrad years at Northern Arizona University. Um, so I was working on, a, a American cheetah fossils from the Grand Canyon. Uh, there was a saber tooth cat jaw from Navajo County, um, that I got kind of working on. Um, but unfortunately Jim found a, a, a great opportunity, um, out East in, in Tennessee. So he kind of, um, jumped ship real quick and went out there to, to establish a new program out, out East. And so it kind of left me in a little bit of a lurch. So, um, I wind up, uh, taking some basic paleo classes with uh, Dr. Dave uh, uh, Elliott. And Dave really opened up my eyes to fossil fish. But initially, it was just kind of like, okay, fish are, you know, cool. But it, when I was taking his early, um, basically just basic paleontology classes, the invert paleontology class, uh, we were uh, discussing the topic of the Kaibab formation. And the Kaibab is the bedrock pretty much all Flagstaff, Arizona, really, at least a good portion, portion of it. And he was saying, oh, yeah, so if you wander around NAU campus, you're going to find fossils of the Kaibab formation here, dotting here and there. And, you know, he being a fish paleontologist, he's like, oh, yeah, and we, there were some fish, you know, fossils recorded out of there, some shark teeth and things like that. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, and I used to collect, you know, fossil shark teeth at the Calvert Cliff, uh, Cliffs, which are all Miocene marine beds. Uh, when I go visit my dad um, out in Maryland, you know, uh, almost every summer. Uh, so I was familiar with sharks, but they weren't necessarily on my radar. 
However, that all changed uh, coming back from a class. I was going from basically north campus to south campus, and the the footpath trail as you go from one end of the, the school to the other, it cuts through all of these bedrock of Kaibab. And off of one footpath trail, there was this one rock sticking out, and right on the surface of it was a shark tooth. In fact, it wound up turning out to be the topic of our talk today, um, t- a tina camp shark tooth. It's like, whoa, what is this? So I collected it, took it back to Dave, and I was like, Dave, what is this? And and uh, he's like, oh, yeah, that's a shark tooth, JP. It looks like a little cladded on tooth. And I was like, oh, this is cool. So I started spending my weekends or any between class times just hunting shark teeth. And then we wound up working with um, a local collector of name of Tom Olson. Um, and Tom Olson had generated this fantastic collection of all these local Kaibab fossils within the Flagstaff and some other areas just outside of town. Um, and we started to kind of build this project where we were just looking at the, the shark fossils and identifying them and describing them. And so like one of my first papers um, right after college was actually on the, the Tinacanth shark teeth uh, from the Kaibab formation. And we found up identifying at least three different species of uh, Tina cans from from that uh, horizon, and I got hooked. And uh, from there, it kind of snowballed into all kinds of other shark projects. After that, so um, so yeah, so I, I got my undergrad at uh, Northern Arizona University with a with a uh, bachelor of science in biology and geology. Uh, kind of took a brief break, took some uh, graduate classes. Because uh, when I got out, out of school, it was like right at the, the height of the recession. So there wasn't exactly a lot of work to be had. Um, but I managed to work briefly at the Museum of Northern Arizona. And then the recession hit really, Flagstaff really hard. So jobs kind of dried up. At least funding for jobs dried up. And so uh, with the encouragement of my father, um, my wife and I moved uh, out to Maryland and kind of tried to jumpstart you know, our lives a little bit. And so at that point, I also decided to finish my graduate education and went to um, St. Joseph's University in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia, really. Um, and I started uh, studied under um, Eileen Grogan and also in turn with her husband, uh, Richard Lunn. And so for those of you who do not know, Eileen Grogan and Dr. Lunn, um, they are the people who are the, the spearheading the research at Bear Gulch Limestone, which is a late Mississippian age locality in Montana that preserves basically fish in their entirety on these, you know, limestone slabs. And uh, basically, if you look at any textbook that talks about shark evolution, um, you'll see basically their work front and center because they've bra- broken boundaries with their discoveries at Bear Gulch because they find these sharks that most of which we knew from from like isolated teeth, you know, going back to the 1800s. Um, but here they are. The teeth are in place in jaws and they look nothing like the sharks we see today. So it's very eye opening working uh, with those deposits because, you know, you thought you knew about sharks and then you see something on the slab with these teeth. And you're like, I never knew it would look like that. So um, so working with them was very eye opening. And um that experience has really uh, allowed me to kind of get a better understanding, you know, what cartilaginous fish can do in terms of uh, both in their ecology and their evolution. Um, and they, they are unexpected in, in so many ways and how they can form and, and interact with their environments. So, so with some, some of the stuff I'm doing now with uh, like uh, Mammoth Cave, uh, we're coming across shark specimens that are very much related to the stuff I've seen in Bear Gulch and going, okay, yeah, I can plug those in now um, in an ecological sense um, based on what I worked with, with in terms of working with Dr. Grogan, Dr. Lund. So, and then after that, I wound up getting a job again with the, uh, uh, the dinosaur park and the national park service. And here's a, here I am today. So. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Going back to what you're saying about, being in Arizona, not really expecting much for fossils. I was kind of in the same boat when I moved to Arizona. uh, There is very few uh, shark publications out. And I, and I always heard that like these teeth are super rare here. So like, good luck finding any of them, but that's kind of just like the tip of the iceberg. And like what's beneath is like the you know, 50 plus taxa in the NACO formation. You have more than that in the um, Kaibab too, right? Right, yeah. And you have all of these things that like, if you weren't a part of the research of it, you wouldn't know existed because they're not published. But like, you know, things are slowly adding Coming up. out. Yeah. Yeah, and that's also kind of the problem. It's like, 
so yeah, we have these rich assemblages of sharks within like Arizona alone. So the Naco is a great, great example. So there was one public uh, publication that came out in like 2004 and that was about the time I started, you know, going to NAU. Yeah. And um, at the time, that's kind of like what they knew. And that paper came about because Dave would take uh, his students out to these sites uh, to kind of learn about, you know, fossils in situ. Um, mm -hmm. Naco was great because there's great outcrops and, and at least two different localities. Um, that are very rich in fossils, and so it's, it gives students the identity, uh, the chance to identify things not only in the field, but then take samples back and identify them in the lab. And a byproduct of that is that it came across every once in a while shark fossils. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and again, it, a lot of that was also kind of pointed out from Tom Olson. Tom Olson has to be crowned the king of finding all these important localities, uh, at least for sharks, uh, in Arizona. Uh, so because he he went out there and he was a prolific collector and and identified all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so that famous Coles Ranch beds, you know, you know the hill that has a little all those little tiny little yeah. uh. <laughs> Uh, Warren Shark Teeth. Um, Tom found that, or at least I'm pretty sure he's the one who should be credited for it, because he's the one who kind of like poked around, and then he found other spots in that area that had really good fossils too. And then um, the other site, which is mentioned in the literature near Strawberry, um, he also identified that locality. In fact, there's a sponge named after him because he found mm -hmm. a sponge. Um, but um, the cool thing is, is that within recent years and since i've been working with dave we found a couple other localities really close to those to those two other sites that had produced more prodigious materials of sharks in, in better conditions and so that's really kind of spearheading um, what i'm kind of slowly working on is a revision of all the naco sharks mm -hmm. again again going up into the younger rocks and the permian uh, we found all kinds of cool stuff in the kaiba especially in and around arizona uh, flagstaff arizona and so we have microsites, you know, that have produced prodigious amount of small fishing materials. And the, and the thing I would always tell my colleagues and, and to the students is that your diversity is going to be those little fish because those little fish are going to be everywhere and they're going to have all kinds of different shapes and sizes and stuff like that. So, yeah, when I'm talking about like 70 different species of, you know, sharks alone from the Kaibab, it's largely because of the small micro stuff. So uh, that's why I was like, yeah, you, well, you love the big teeth, but keep alive for the little guys, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, not to, to digress too far, um, but uh, yeah, so it's a lot of that kind of work that produces uh, some good results. Yeah. And speaking of these Paleozoic sites, you can find them in Arizona, but you publish on a couple different localities most recently. So let's talk about what the order of um, Chondrichthian that you recently published on, which are the Tenacanthiforms. So let's yeah. talk about what exactly those are. What is a tenacanth? I always get that question. In fact, that was actually one of those questions I tried to answer um, with a specimen that I found uh, back in 2013. Um, so we'll start with the first question. So what is a tenacanth? Um, a tenacanth, at least into the research I've done, they are a group of um, sharks that ha have these large spines that are in front of their dorsal fins. So they have two dorsal fins and thus two spines. They originally were identified in the early 1800s um, and the term tenacanth means comb spine. And what they're referring to is that on the back of the little tips of the spines are these little denticles that come off of the back forming kind of like a comb structure. At least that's what um, Agassiz thought it was uh, when, you know, when he saw him, he's like, oh, I got to comb my hair with them. Uh, and that's what they were first based on. They were just spines. And it wasn't until later, a little bit later in the late 1800s, when a first complete uh, Tina Camp skeleton with the spines in place was found um, in Scotland. And so that was the work by a gentleman named uh, Troquer. And he named this thing called Tinacanthus costellatus. So costellatus is a shark, maybe like, you know, a little bit about that big. It's not super huge, um, but it's known from a complete skeleton. And it's one of those specimens that's like, it still needs some work to be done. But uh, some of my colleagues have already kind of like started to tease out more information. So it actually has a new genus now. It's called Glencartius. Um, But anyway, so... They have these spines, and because they had these spines, people were thinking, oh, they're elasmobranch. So if you think about the, the big shark family tree, they're divided into two major groups. Um, a lot of people still kind of use the old classic term of holocephalans or holocephali as being what is known as the ratfish group. Um, and these are the chondrichthians that tend to have more plate-like dentitions. Um, their jaws are a little bit more closely associated with the, the skull. They don't really move around a lot. 
Um, and then their gills are actually more positioned, you know, kind of like under the head rather than being directly behind the head. And that's been kind of the major classification on it. Now it's getting much more complex with more, more data that's coming in, especially in some of their observations of some of the other groups of things. So, so there's a group of sharks called the Samorids, um, best known like from Stethacanthus and, and uh, things like Samorium. Um, those have been classically called the Lasmobranchs, and I'll go back to that group in a second. Um, but now they've been, based on studies on their brain cases, uh, they've been lumped in with the, the ratfish. Um, Lasma branks actually has to go again, you have to do with their gills, but starting with their jaws, um, their jaws are, are typically more loosely attached by ligaments to the cranium. Um, they have the typical, what we think consider like shark teeth structures, uh, as for their dentition. So individual teeth. And then again, their gills, we're going with uh, the lasmal brank part of it is directly behind the head. And then the rest of the body can do a whole kinds of bunch of different things in terms of their pectoral fins and tails, et cetera, and all kinds of stuff. But it usually has to do with their heads, gills, and dentition that really kind of defines either two groups. Mm -hmm. And so the tenacants had more of a lasmobranch kind of like structures. Um, but then some colleagues started looking at the teeth and saying, okay, what is primitive? What is considered derived? And they're kind of like, okay, well, we'll put the uh, tenacants closely related to more like the samoriums, things like stethacanthus, because they have similar shaped teeth, which we call the cladodont uh, uh, condition. Cladodon teeth are basically teeth that have up to at least three to five uh, cusps, maybe a little more depending on who you are, on a tooth base that's more flat rather than kind of like coming down like more of a rectangular prong. So you see in like your typical more derived shark teeth, like especially those we see today. Um, and it's actually more of an angle. So if your crown is like this, your base is more of an L shape. So, and they have this platform. And sometimes it's also known as a reniform or kidney bean shaped tooth uh, base. And it is an overall shared generalization that both tenacants and things like Samorium um, have. They have this kind of quote unquote cladodont type tooth. The major differences, however, is that in tenacants, the crown has all enamel connected between all the different uh, uh, cusps and things like that. Um, so you have a big center cusp and then you have lateral cusps on the side and all the enamel uh, tissues are all connected uh, between the cusps. In threads, all samorids, there is no connection between the cusps. There's basically the crown, space, gap, which the the, the, basic, the basal tooth root uh, tish, uh, tissues, and then the lateral cusps will have their own uh, specific enamel covering. There's no connection together whatsoever. The other thing we're finding out is that Internally, in some more teeth, they have a less complex, uh, complex vascular system. It's basically a few channels going up into the roots and, and into the, the uh, crown. And I really shouldn't use the word root because they don't really root like, you know, our teeth. So the toothpaste is be uh, better. But they go through the toothpaste and then go up into uh, the crown. And things like tenacans, it's much more complex. It's similar to what you see in modern sharks is that you have a very much complex vascular tubular system internally of the tooth. So this quote unquote cladodont may be a kind of a paraphyletic trait that's evolved multiple times within very primitive shark or shark lineages um, or carlogenous fish lineages. So to classify, because you have class, uh, cladodont teeth, you all should be lumped together into these, these big groups doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually part of the research that we did. Um, what really became a kind of a cornerstone of kind of dividing things out is that I was lucky in 2013 that I discovered a complete skeleton of a tenacanth um, in the mountains just outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. That was uh, from Pennsylvanian age beds are about 300 million years old. And uh, we wound up naming it Draco Pristis, which is the, the dragon shark. And it was basically complete from the end of the nose to the end of the tail and everything was in place. So it really kind of gave us a, a whole better kind of hallmark on like, you know, how Tina can't look and, you know, what they should be. So we did the cladistic analysis based on several traits and it showed that, yeah, Tina can't were actually a sister group to the modern shark lineage, which we call the Usalakian grade sharks. So that includes things like hybodonts, modern sharks, um, and, and rays. And anything in between and then tenacants may have in itself as a branch share or sister relationship with another group of sharks called xenacants xenacants are really well known to be freshwater sharks um they kind of also have more of a complex um vascular system in their dentitions and a lot of it some share some similar kind of like you know enameloid connections depending on who you are um but they've been in the past 
suggested being you know more closely related to a very primitive shark called phobodonts and phobodonts another another huge uh, kind of discussion we didn't know much about phobodonts until we there's some new specimens that are coming out of morocco that really answers a lot of questions and um so what's really what we're finding out now based on new material is that you have the samorids which again stethacanthus and samorium and, and everything in between like falcatus and stuff like that they are a weird branch on their own and things like cladosalaki which is a classic devonian primitive shark they have a show seeing you know being chased by duncal osteus and stuff like that that group and another thing which i think uh should be in there called squatinactus which is a very derived relative uh, in my opinion to cladus alaki they're all lumped together as one group that could either be an elasmobranch or some people have argued as being actually very basal ratfish relatives um and then things like phobodonts things like phobotus uh thrinacus alaki um and then up into the xenocants those guys are like the primitive branch just before you get into the modern shark lineages so uh so there's that story of shark family trees so tinicants yeah they're they're modern shark cousins but they're probably not considered true modern shark relatives yeah there's a lot of different like twists and turns that you get when you're looking at the teeth because for the most part most um not only paleozoic but most chondrichthian taxa as a whole are known primarily based on their fossilized teeth and that's why you had some hypotheses like those, um, the cladodons being like a stem grade chondrichthian, and you'd have the like eusilacian grade uh, root structures that you can see on, you know, things like hybodonts, early true sharks, as well as some what we consider now to be like ratfish relatives, like, um, like some of the, why am I blanking? Like some eugenodonts, and yeah, I think you're like thinking that. of the world two yeah. sharks. Yeah. So you think of Helicoprion, you think of like Orotus, which is a cousin to the Eugene Don world two groups and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, those so were hypothesized to like be grouped together because mm -hmm. of that share tooth base. But now when you're looking at brain cases, it kind of tells a different story. Oh God, brain cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always like, I always kind of tease my, at least in my mind, tease my co uh, colleagues who specialize primarily on uh, on shark brain cases um they, i always think of them they're like they're zombies they're like ah oh, brains you know they're just that's what their always mentality is and and don't get me wrong brain cases have great data and because the reason being and this is why a lot of people say why brain cases is that what they record is like the minute evolutionary tra uh, changes in the the vascularization of the brain um in terms of like um the nerve endings and stuff like that, they, they come out from the, like, you know, the uh, foramen magnum and some of the other parts of the brain that are not part of the foramen magnum, et cetera. Um, but you can see the minute changes and those are a lot more easier to like kind of record evolutionarily uh, compared to say something like teeth because teeth, you eat them all over the place. And mm -hmm. it turns out uh, a lot of times, and I'll go with this in a second, but it's like the teeth will have certain traits, kind of like that cladodon thing, where it's like, they all look the same. So we can just kind of lump them together. Um, my, my personal mantra when I working with teeth is that it's, you, a lot of people concentrate on the crowns like, cause that's the, that's the sexy part of a shark tooth, right? It's always the sharp part. It's always the thing that is like always hard and, and survives the fossilization process. A lot of times the, the tooth base will kind of erode away and doesn't leave much or, you know, people kind of ignore it altogether. But I think the, the, when you work on these things, you need to kind of think about, okay, the base is who you are because the structures of the base will tell you what the relationship is going to be because those, again, like the brain case, only minutely change over time, but the crown could do all kinds of things throughout time um, on a base that's, you know, barely changing. So uh, the base tells you who you are and then the crown tells you what you do. You know, so if you are rounded and lumpy, you're probably a durophagus crunching shark. If you're sharp and bladed, you're a very more active predator. And if you're more like a spiky pitchfork, you're kind of a generalist, you know, that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. people may argue against me, but that's just kind of the way I work. Um, anyway, but yeah, getting back to brain cases. And yeah, and that's where the, the surprising answers were starting to come in terms of uh, like things like Samorium and, and Sithicanthus and their, and their relatives. So work on the brain cases, cases was showing is that they had certain traits that you actually see in ratfish um, having especially have to do with like um, how the brain case is constructed. A lot of it's a short brain case uh, where the ears and, and um, the, the, yeah, the, the, the channels for the ears and then how the foramen magnum kind of attaches to the skull. 
um, are very short, which is something you always see in a lot of the, the ratfish relatives, including modern ratfish. And then you have specialization where the eyes are huge. So these are very visual predators. And I'm fine with that. But the one thing I've never quite seen in, in these arguments that some words are ratfish is like, well, what about the idea of convergence? Were these potentially elasmobranchs, early elasmobranchs that kind of took like, you know what, I'm going to use my eyes more than my other sensory ad adaptations mm -hmm. uh, compared to, you know, other elasmobranchs uh, to be an active predator. Oh. So, um, so for, for the most part, I'm, I'm, I'm easy to go with the idea that, you know, things like Stephacanthus could be potentially relatives to ratfish, but I'm also on the fence going, you know, but if you look at everything behind the head, um, they look very much like, you know, true sharks, even though they're, if you really get into the nitty gritty of the details, they're, they're really weird, you know, Lazarbrank type sharks. So, or they would be. So, um, until I get more evidence, you know, I'll, I, I can go either way at this point, but, yeah. um, but yeah, in terms of me though, I, I argue strongly that Tina cats are cousins to, uh, modern, uh, modern day sharks. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are true elasmobranchs. Possibility that the brain case could have derived later on within the elasmobranch tree, as in you could have that as a stem grade elasmobranch. And then the trait that we commonly think of as belonging to elasmobranchs could have evolved later on with that, where it's still branched off from the ratfish group, but just evolved afterwards. Yeah, and that was actually kind of one of the things that uh, working with uh, Dr. Grogan and Dr. Lung kind of like hammered into me was is that um, always expect the unexpected because, you know, there's going to be things that are going to pop up. You're going, well, we have these great models of like how these evolution trends happens. And then all of a sudden this thing pops up in the fossil record going, damn, that just throws everything out the window, you know? So, um, and they have lots of stuff from Bear Gulch that does that. So um, the only, the only thing I have as a gripe about those guys is that they're really slow on writing up this stuff. So it's kind of like, come on, move it. Cause so we can, so we can cite it. Um, so, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's very much possible that certain these, these traits can pop up again over and over again. And, and I, I see that in, in the fossil record a lot, to be honest. You know, there's certain you'll see things in, in um some of the uh ratfish relatives will have teeth fairly similar to like, you know, hybodonts. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think also it kind of leads to some of these discussions, like, you know, what what do we consider a a, a true hybodont tooth compared to like, you know, a parasolacian grade tooth or something like that? Because I have a feeling that what's been called hybodonts and deeper time may actually be parasolacians uh just some some of the traits i've been seeing but um and vice versa who knows maybe these these parasolacians could have been uh or had hybridon teeth and we've just been calling them the wrong thing you know so or hybridon like teeth and what are your thoughts of that uh tooth-based hypothesis that ginter had where like you said you had some parasolacians that had a tooth base very similar to uh, what do they call it the Lucilacian grade type teeth? Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's like, you know, these things kind of evolved multiple times. Um, which again is kind of like when we start to, you know, dividing out the two major trees, when we think about what we call stem uh chondrichthians, you know, the idea of putting things like Tina Canthus and some more, it's at that base where everything else divides off, I don't think quite works right. Um, because I think what we really need to talk about is stems, uh, stem sharks in general, you know, using sharks as a uh, general mm -hmm. term, for, uh, all cartilaginous fish, um, it's probably going to be in the, the acanthodian grade conditions, yeah. you know? So, um, I think, you know, depending on that, yeah, I, I think what is, is happening is just, it's evolutionary repeats, um, convergent evolution on a toothpaste. Uh, the idea is that you need to, to be understanding of like, where the divide is or where, what what separates the two out from each other, even though they have similar dentitions. So for example, as a lesson for you, um, when you look at the Parasolacian grade or even the Eugenodon type teeth, um, when they have these kind of like bar-like tooth bases and they ha what they will have is multiple uh, nutrient foramina, you know, the, the vascular systems uh, for the tooth base. But what they tend to have, uh, in, at least in the ratfish group, they're very narrow very narrow they're actually narrower than the crown itself where on the other hand hybodonts and also their close relatives the proactor protoacrodonts um they tend to have their two bases uh as wide or wider than their crown so um if you look at a, a true high like hybodo like hybodus tooth you look at the root of that thing or the base of that thing and it's wider than the crown it's pretty broad and then um 
with the the difference between those teeth and the protoacrodonts is that the protoacrodonts tend to actually have their tooth base more lingually projected. So, so now that we got over a synopsis on the tenacants and their phylogeny and all of that, let's get into the new publication that you just released. So sure. let's so first let's talk about like the geological settings that these finds came from. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, our recent publication on two new Tina Can sharks from uh, Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky and northern Alabama. Um, these are fossil sites that date between the middle Mississippian period to the late Mississippian period. If you want to really get specific about it, it's, it's from two uh, sub-time periods or sub-periods sub called the Visean and the Serpicovian. Um, and that's using the um, international coding for uh, you know geologic horizons and things like that. Um, so the majority of the stuff we were using in the paper uh, was had come from uh, Mammoth Cave. A lot of that material was come uh, from the St. Louis limestone, uh, also known as St. Louis Formation, which is the oldest of the geologic horizons that we we talked about, and it's classically were some of the the earliest um, shark fossils that we described um, back in the eighteen hundreds had had come from. Um, the one horizon above that is the St. Genevieve, which has the most prodigious fossil shark records that I've ever seen. Um, you know, outside of like the Kaibab Formation, and uh, the St. Gen is uh, what's known as a um, a biostrome. So basically, it's one layer that's just made up entirely of basically invertebrate fossils. So it's mostly like fragments of uh, crinoids and blastoids, and there's you know horn corals and stuff dotting here and there. Um, and then we also have uh, what's also known as the Haney Formation, um, which is actually into. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, there's no, no, yeah, the Haney. Um, there's a Haney formation that had one record of a Glickmanius as part of that, and that was the up the late Mississippian portion of uh, Mammoth Cave. And then the stuff that we were describing in uh, from northern Alabama, um, those were from the uh, 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 shale unit, it was kind of a co equivocal, or it's, it's, it's sometimes I guess it's uh, uh, so they're part of the Mont Eagle formation. And then also above that is the Bangor. And the Bangor is also similar in being kind of a biostrom or a bioherm kind of thing, where it's just like piles upon piles of, of invertebrate material forming the, the, the deposition. So both of these, all these beds that we were discussing in our paper, they come from two major, like, you know, uh, geologic time stories. First, it's kind of like just prior to the formation of Pangaea. And uh, at that time, there was this uh, seaway called the, uh, the the Reddick Ocean that's basically connected the waterways that we now cover most of uh, um, the uh, North American, what we now consider North America uh, region. And then it connected uh, places where like, you know, England and Russia and stuff like that. And then that's about the mill uh, Mississippi time period is that before time. Uh, getting into the late Mississippi, and that's about the time when the, the uh, Reddick Ocean was basically sealed off. Um, that's when Pangaea was just now really starting colliding. Africa was really basically slamming into the northeastern part of the North America. And so it was cutting off um, waterways for fish to migrate and, and transfer over to. So um, with that, it, it created new environments and things like that. Um, so Mammoth Cave really tells the story of life really well before the collision of Pangaea and the, the ceiling of the, the Reddick Ocean, because a lot of those beds we're seeing in the St. Gen, again, super rich in fossils and, and uh, especially shark fossils. Um, but then after that, um, the bed right above that, uh, the beginning of the late Mississippian, uh, it's called the Gherkin Formation, and we get sharks there. But they're not as prevalent. They're they're mm -hmm. like few and far between. It's almost like when you look at the depositional beds. They're almost like a oceanic uh, uh, desert. And when we refer to that, um, the best way you can you can see visually a modern environment that's like that is like when you go or see video of like these tropical islands with these like beautiful white sand uh, seaways and embayments and stuff like that. Those are typical are what we consider like oceanic deserts because there's hardly any life there. Um, where you find you know, scores of, of animal life tend to be like, you know, the waters are murkier and, and they have like coral reefs and stuff like that. But when you have these like sandy areas, hardly anything there. And there's fish there, but, you know, few and far between. And that's what we kind of see in the gherkin. It's a different story, though, when you go down south to North Alabama. 
it's like it's almost like the 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 funnel of cement just shifted. And so when you get into Alabama, that late Mississippian beds are very similar to what we saw in the middle Mississippian beds of, uh, at Mammoth Cave. Um, they are just like you know, chock full of life. Uh, again, there's like these, you know, huge mounds of, you know, reef bearing uh, or assemblaging uh, organisms. So you have like, you know, crinoids, blastoids, horn corals, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's just, you know, younger rocks. Um, but those rocks are very similar in, uh, to the age of rocks you see at the Bear Gulch uh, localities in Montana. And uh, so their faunal assemblages are, are kind of similar too overall. Um, but uh, digressing is that uh, within this horizon, we, we identified two new species of Tina Can sharks. Uh, the first one is is completely brand new. It's called Troglocodotus uh, trimbleli. And Troglocodotus literally tra translates to the, the cave branch tooth or the cave clodotus, if we put it that way. And we named it after um, Barkay Tremble, who is the superintendent of Mav Cave and who has serendipitously found the very first specimen. He was with us like when I did my first trip down to, to Mammoth Cave and um, we went to the area um, where we found something, you know, cool prior uh, prior to that visit. And he looks up, he's like, hey, there's a shark tooth right there. And I was like, yeah, that is. I've never seen anything like that before. So we collected and, and that became the first specimen of Trogol Codotus. Um, we found a couple more uh, since then um, at Mammoth Cave. And in fact, we found a couple new ones uh, just after the, we got the publication submitted. And then working with uh, 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 Chase Egley, um, he had said, hey, you know, I got some cool stuff coming from the Bangor. You know, would you want to come check this out? And so we went through their collections, especially I was interested in the Tina Camp fossils. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. That's that shark I saw in Mammoth Cave, but it's in the Younger Rocks. What the heck? <laughs> so um, we wound up uh, adding that material into the project and invited uh, Chase and, and um, Gabe Ward, who collected that material, um, into the project. So so that was the first one. That's the first shark we described. The second one is a shark called uh, Glickmanius careforum. Now the genus Glickmanius is really well known from like Pennsylvania age rocks, so about let's say you know about three hundred million years up into the Permian, um, probably kind of quieting out around about uh, two hundred sixty uh, million years or so. And so Glickmanius is known worldwide. Um, it's historically been con largely confused with Samorium reniform, which is this you know uh, well known uh, Samoan shark uh, from uh, Indiana, which is known as from the uh, from the what we call the black shale beds. And um, the reason being is that there was confusion on like how the teeth look. So the Samorium actually has kind of similar teeth to what you see in Tina Cast, except again, you see that kind of same pattern of um, the enamel not quite connecting all the way across of the tooth, but it does have a little bit of a depression in the front. We call it a basal labial depression. Um, and then the other thing is the, the tooth base also has that classic, you know, kidney bean shape. And people are kind of like, oh, you know, we're just lumping identifications. And so a lot of these, what we call glickmanius teeth, were lumped into Samorium because they thought they were the same dang thing. And it also kind of traces back to some work that was done in the 80s uh, by a guy named Williams. And he kind of like, yeah, this kind of looks like that, so I'm going to call it Samorium. And, and that's where the, a lot of the confusion came from. And then about 2005, Michael Ginter kind of revised everything we knew about, you know, glickmanius. And in fact, he's the one who coined the genus Glickmanius. Originally, it was called uh, Clodotus uh, occidentalis. And so now it's Glickmanius occidentalis as the type species. Um, and then they've identified a smaller species um, called Glickmanius myocovensis, roughly from the same kind of Pennsylvanian into the Permian age rocks. So we had two species in the Pennsylvanian and the Permian, Glickmanius occidentalis and then Glickmanius uh, my, uh, myocovensis. And uh, those were actually some of the sharks that I first came across when I was working in the Kaibab. So yeah, those things, both taxa, were found prevalently in the Kaibab. Um, and basically what it is is that Glickmanius occidentalis is a bigger species and Myocovensis is a smaller species. That's pretty much it, except for some minor details. Um, but uh, but that's kind of like what we know about Glickmanius. It's come from this Pennsylvania and Permian record. So we were going through the stuff we were collecting from uh, Mammoth Cave and we're going, wait a minute, these look like Glickmanius teeth. What the heck? Because we're talking now middle Mississippian. That's that's almost another like 50 million years between the two records. So it's kind of like, okay, this is different. 
Um, and we started looking at the details of the teeth going, yeah, these are a little bit different. They're a little bit more robust in terms of their, their structure. They're not as high and pointed as uh, the other species. And so it's like, yeah, this is probably a new, a uh, new animal. And, um, and kind of like roll back a little bit. So the whole point I got involved with Mammoth Cave in the first place is that the, the park interpreters and the cavers who work there, um, they were coming across shark fossils and it was about the end of 2018 when, um, uh, Rick, Rick Toomey, who's now one of the, the, the major scientists who works works there, um, he sent us this, this this photograph of some teeth that were associated with some strange looking cartilages in the cave wall at uh, Mammoth Cave. And it's like, hey, do we have a shark skeleton here? And I took a look at the picture. And I'm going, no, what you have there is a shark head. And it was, it was the size of it that that blew our minds. Because uh, what was also very important is that the teeth that were associated with these cartilages was a tenacanth known as Cyvotus striatus. And that was a historic uh, animal um, that first was a really truly identified in the 1800s, and then it was given a new genus name in the early 2000s, et cetera, et cetera. But it's been known for a long time as teeth. Nothing else has ever been found associated. And then so here's this like jaw and some other bits um, that was all together just kind of like, whoa, wait a minute, this this is a game changer here. Um, so we were looking at that and then, um, because we got all excited that, yeah, okay, we're finding cartilage and, and skeletal parts in Mammoth Cave. Um, Rick Toomey actually went back through some old records, um, from the Cave uh, Research Foundation, um, that they did survey work. So one thing about Mammoth Cave, for those who do not know, is it's the one, of the longest cave passage systems in the world. Um, again, I can't forget the, the it's like almost a thousand miles or more than a couple thousand miles when you line up everything from end to end in terms of the cave passages. And so mapping is a very big deal for cavers and things like that. So there's these groups that would actually go in and that's all they did. They just go into new passageways and stuff like that and just map the cave. And so there's a, there was a record uh, from the early 90s or early mid 90s that said, hey, we were mapping this section here in, in Mammoth Cave, and we had, we see some fish jaws. And, uh, of course, at the time, it's like, okay, fish jaws, you know, big deal. But now we're starting looking at sharks in Mammoth Cave. Um, and it was just like, like I think it was like right before 4th of the July uh, weekend or something like that. Rick finds this record. He goes in with an assistant. And that day, he was like, oh, my God there's he's like jp he sends an email he's like look at this and it was basically an associated set of jaws um of a shark and right at the end of the jaws the teeth kind of kind of you know fell out um were the teeth of glickmanias and this is a big deal because much like Cyvotus, was most of what we knew about glickmanias was from a very few bits and pieces of skeletal material there's a partial skeleton without jaws from nebraska um that was briefly kind of touched upon here and there occasionally um but never like 100 percent fully described and to find jaws with teeth this two good money was just like wow this is cool because then we can actually add a face and of course i've already done the work with uh you know the shark i discovered in new mexico uh draco pristis and a lot of the details are kind of lining up because we suggested in our description of draco pristis that draco pristis and good money were related and then now we have these jaws, and we go, yeah, there's there's a lot of shared details between the two, except Manius did not have as heavy set jaws um, compared to Draco Pristis, based on the the uh, Mammoth Cave specimen. And in fact, they actually share some characteristics that we saw for another shark called Hesorotus. And so, as part of this project, we're like, okay, we're getting a lot more information uniting Hesorotus, Draco Pristis, and Glickmanius, and possibly some of these other teeth that have shared similarities. So, some of the Kaibab stuff that I described earlier. Uh, so, one of the new sharks that we described in that paper uh, for the Kaibab stuff was an animal called Kaibab Venator, which were huge, massive, serrated Tinacant teeth, you know? Um, we can go, okay, we're going to unite all these things under this one family that was proposed um, by John Maisie in, I think it's, what, 2005 or maybe 2012? I can't remember the, right off the top of my head. But he proposed a family of Tina Can sharks called the Hesorotidae. Problematic about that is that all John did was look at spines. And Hesorotus is known from partial skeletons uh, from the same beds you find Samorium um, in Indiana and Illinois. And... Um, but the teeth of Hesorotus are very similar to what you see in Glickmanius and Dracopristus and stuff like that. And so since the description of Hesorotus or the Hesorotidae 
uh, by John Maisy, um, some of my fellow co-workers, you know, we've been kind of alluding to that, you know, Hesarode has teeth families or teeth taxa um, that would easily be allied to Hesarode even though they don't have spines. Well, I looked at it again and go, you know what? There's a problem here because the spines that have been referred to, Glucmanius and Dracopristus, they look the same, but they look nothing like Hesarodus and the other tax that has been uh, put in as Hesarodidae. So as part of the paper, we kind of made this counter argument saying, you know, we need a broader description of what Hesarodidae includes. And so I put down the notion that Hesarodidae does include things like Glycmonius, Dracopristus, Hesarodus, a bunch of other tooth-based taxa, because they all share the same kind of dental formula anatomy. Um, but the spines, they're going to be very variable within this group of this family group um and it, and it kind of goes back to the discussion you know how you define an order how you define a family and because sometimes i think some of my my shark colleagues you know they kind of uh put the two together because michael uh ginter still uses uh places uh glicmanius into the family tinacantidae in fact you look up a tinacantidae um uh, on wikipedia you have glicmanius in there um uh, which i don't think is correct um at least that's part of the argument with our, our recent paper and so um you have to kind of think of it as what's the order doing so how do you visualize an order well let's use my favorite uh, grouping the carnivora mammalian carnivores so the order carnivora is huge and you have to think of all the families that are involved and there's two major branches much like in sharks there's two major branches of sharks there's two major branches of carnivores so you have the the dog slash bear group and then you have the cat slash hyena group and yet they all share a common ancestor at some point um but they are two major branches and they evolved off into various different niches and things like that and that's how i kind of visualize tina cats as a as a as an order you have all kinds of various different groups and you have various different families within this large order and they've evolved to, to evolve to be different kinds of different things in terms of like how they feed and, and stuff like that um so i feel like i'm digressing there but anyway um so that was kind of our, our major other take-home message about this recent paper it's like you know we have enough information let's kind of revise things a, a little bit in terms of the higher taxonomic discussions uh, so we now broaden how we refer to the heseroted tina cans uh, to include things like Glucmanius and, and some of these other two types. And I, I hope it sticks. But we'll see. Um, but um, yeah, so but that's the cool thing about Mammoth Cave, um, at least from my end, is that Mammoth Cave has other Tina cats. And that's that's kind of some of the other stuff we're going to be working on now. Mm -hmm. um, so the jaws, we have jaws of Glucmanius. We have jaws of a parcel jaw and some other bits of Cyvotus. But to tell a uh, exciting new, a new revelation, we have another skull slash body skeleton that's in the cave right now, and which I'm going to go look at uh, later this week. Right. Um, and the, the jaws are in but much better shape compared to um, either specimens that we reported on before. So the only key thing is, is that we haven't been able to see the teeth yet. Mm. Um, I have my suspicions, which I'm not going to share yet until I, I get a chance to look at it um but if it is what i think it is it's going to be it's gonna tell a much better story but for one of the sharks we find there so but in terms of the tina cans we find there so not only do we have cyvotus which is monster massive shark there and I'll, I'll go into like why i think it's monster massive um but we have again yeah your typical medium-sized tina cans like Agmanius and and uh Trachocodotus. we have another large clodotus species we have uh clodotus mirabilis um there and um we have one at least one really good large size tooth out of, out of that site. Um, we have some things that look like uh, Glencartius um, and it's another, some weirdy kind of Tina Cant types that we're not quite sure who they are yet. Um, so there's a, there's a nice uh, diverse assemblage of uh, these Tina Cant sharks there. So, um, and kind of goes along with what we're seeing in at least this one horizon uh, with St. Genevieve formation um, that there, we know we have like 70 species of fish within that one geologic horizon. And then Chase, we'll, we'll talk your ear off about the Bangor. Bangor is turning out to be something pretty exciting, at least in my opinion, um, just on the diversity of stuff they're getting. Might, it, it could possibly potentially outclass in terms of data um, for the bear gulch in terms of like diversity of sharks. But we'll, we'll have to see as, as that work gets going. Um, mm -hmm. So do you want to go and talk about big sharks now? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the big ones. The big sharks, yeah. 
Um, so I had the pleasure of actually working with some really big Tina cans. So the, my first introduction again was was identifying and describing Kaibab venator. Um, Kaibab venator um, again it's a it's an early to middle Permian uh, shark, and it's the first as we know of right now Tina canth to evolve serrations on the cusps, which is a big deal. A lot of the other Tina cans uh, so far, you know, some develop blade like cusps, others are more kind of like your more rounded spear like. Uh, types um, but to have serrations is, is a big deal it tells you that you are you are designed to eat other big things um, in terms of you know how you evolved and so what's cool about Kaiba Venator they have huge bl blade like teeth and massive wear facets on the tips of their 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 median or primary cusp uh, so these things are biting and hitting hard as they they chomp down on their prey but um, the thing that was making us going wow was the, the dimensions so um the way we kind of judge how big you are as a shark especially with tina cans is the diameter of your tooth base so uh in the tooth base um based on everything we've seen so far uh, you can have kind of extrapolate your body size um by how big your tooth is fitting your jaw so in terms of tina cans you can't really use 100% of modern analog with like modern sharks, especially like, you know, big macro predatory sharks, like, you know, white sharks and things like that. Um, because a lot of those lamniforms and carcarinid uh, type sharks, they tend to have decently sized teeth for their jaws compared to something like a tina canth. Tina canths tend to have small teeth or relatively small teeth for their jaws compared to their more, you know, uh, distant living cousins. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to bear that in mind. So one thing I found out um, when we do have jaws is that if you have a tooth that's about two to two and a half centimeters wide at the base, um, they can fit into a jaw that can be about two feet long. That's huge. Mm -hmm. um, a great white shark does not have a two foot long jaw, let's put it that way. Um, so that was kind of eye opening. And so when you come across teeth that are, uh, so again, two foot long, two and a half to two centimeters wide tooth. Um, and the average head of uh, a Tina canth, based on some dimensions that we've seen throughout the fossil record, kind of ranges somewhere between like maybe like 12, approximately 15% of your body length. So you have a two foot long jaw, you know, and then you add the rest of your body, you're going to stretch out more than like, you know, 15, 16 feet. Um, and again, it's, it's rough and, and it, Having something like you know Draco Prisus and uh, Glentardius really helped us in terms of figuring things out. Um, so again, the the brain to the body size or um, the, the head of body size of of with Glicmanius is some or sorry Draco Prisus is something on the verge of like you know twelve to thirteen feet uh, percentile for the rest of the body, and Draco Prisus is approximately just shy of seven feet long. Uh, it's like six foot six and a half point eight inches or something like that but you know who's counting uh <laughs> but anyway so yeah so we were able to take the measurements and then we kind of like you know all right i have this big tooth you have to fit in a socket this big your jaw's gonna have to be yay big for you know to fit it and so on average some of the the, the average side voters teeth we come across are between again uh two to three centimeters wide um, so that would fit about a two foot long jaw, but then we're coming across teeth that are four centimeters wide. And some of the biggest ones I've seen personally right now. So there's one in the Bangor, um, or is it the shale unit at the, uh, Mont Eagle? Um, anyway, from Northern Alabama, the biggest one I've seen in my hand was five centimeters. The biggest one on record, um, at least in the literature is six centimeters wide. Okay. So that's well over twice as much as the biggest ones I've seen in terms of a tooth fitting into a jaw. And again, so I'm using the jaw that we found in, in Mammoth Cave of Cyvotus. And then there's another jaw from a Devonian shark that's related to Tinacanthus uh, from the Cleveland share, shale that have the same dimensions. So um, so when you come across a uh, big thing, so I actually had a model made. Well, one second, I'm going to disappear for a high screen. Ah, here we go. So I had a model made of a scan from our Cyvotus, and I asked him to scale it up to, uh, let's see if it fit that aside there. There we go. So here's, this is, would be a six centimeter wide tooth. So I scaled it up to the biggest one written in the literature, and this is an interior tooth. Wow. Position. Yeah. So um, from a tooth this size, 
uh, I, I'm basically going to say it's guesstimating to be something along the, uh, the same body lengths and sizes of basking sharks. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, like almost, what, 25, 28 feet, depending on who you talk to or whatever specimen they find. And um, so those are monster sharks, at least in my opinion. And I know there's probably some other forms of other chondrichthians that reach massive body size. We, I mean, people always think, oh, the biggest things that are out there is going to be like, you know, megalodon. I would, I would grant it, megalodon is probably, you know, large um, based on some of the teeth they find. You know, they're, they're guessing somewhere between 50 to 60 feet. And they always keep changing the model depending on, you know, well, is it a long body shark or is it a short stubby shark? You know, um, uh, we really won't know until we actually find a complete skeleton of megalodon. But um, some of the other teeth of other sharks, like um, there's some huge erodus teeth that come from Arizona and Nevada that to me, I think these sharks probably reached um, close to whale shark size, at least uh, based on the dimensions of the teeth. And again, these are sharks and we have two fairly complete or near complete bodies of erodus. They have dinky little teeth for their jaws. So again, if you extrapolate the size, you know, so if you have a tooth like, you know, yay big, there's, there's a big one like that from Nevada, you know, that's going to be a monster head attached to a very elongated body. So. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that there are some around Megalodon sized Paleozoic chondrichthines that were swimming around. Yeah, maybe not. People like to visualize, you know, like, you know, the Meg movies, badass giant chomping on ships or something like that, you know, kind of uh sharks but they're going to be large they're probably and if you really think about modern sharks today they're not going to be massive predatory types they're going to be you know swimming around benign eating other things that you know are either slow moving mm -hmm. um crunching down on on mollusks and stuff like that or filter feeding i mm -hmm. don't think cyvotus was a filter feeder but there's some potential that i'm wondering um based on the way the teeth are shaped that they probably may have been hunting down um i'm wondering if they're hunting down big cephalopods you know, there's some, you know, idea that there's, you know, potential of big cephalopods that are soft body we don't know about. And maybe, you know, Cyvotus was chomping down on these. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to say. Um, but I think, and that's the Mississippian period. I think when we you actually go up, because we have a four centimeter wide uh, kybavenator. And so that thing, again, looking at the wear, is probably chomping down on fish. Um, and by this time, yeah, there are big sharks by this time. Um, and other big bony fish. We have some evidence of really big bony fish from the Kaibab uh, coming from there. So um, big uh, platysomid type things, your deep bodied fishes. And I think there's at least some evidence of one that was probably at least four feet all deep, you know, so. Yeah, Kaibab is an interesting one. And what were your thoughts on Carcharopsis? So... Looking at the teeth of Carcharopsis, if I just looked at the teeth and don't know anything else about uh, what has been described now, um, I would have been like, ah, Carcharopsis is maybe a good idea to be a, a tinacanth, you know, highly derived, uh, another serrated uh, lineage of uh, tinacanth uh, sharks. But they found more parts of it. And if you look at the jaws and the brain case, it actually tells more of a story that it's, it's actually probably more closely related to modern sharks than tinacanths. Its brain, brain case is almost... Uh, almost hybodont shaped in terms of like the overall, you know, details. Um, and then you look at the jaws, you know, they're almost proto-acrodont type teeth. So, uh, or sorry, proto-acrodont type jaws uh, for the cranium. So, mm -hmm. um, so this is probably from a different lineage. And if you actually look at the fossil record of Carcharopsis, it's very rare. You don't get a lot of it. Um, I think the, um the sites they find in arkansas is like the the most prolific is not only you have you know teeth but you also have body fossils of these things but usually it's like one two couple specimens here and there uh from these other uh like mississippian sites so mm -hmm. and were there any other um were there any other chondrichthians that you think would have rivaled a uh cyvotus like a full-size cyvotus Erodus. Erodus would be the one that I would uh, argue. Uh, mm -hmm. The other potential is uh, Tinacanth called Clodotus mirabilis because um, we have a fairly uh, wide tooth that comes from Mammoth Cave uh, from the St. Jen uh, formation. and uh, But we only have like one of them so far. So again, it's probably another rare kind of like, you know, occasional 
um, big chart type thing. So, mm -hmm. and also some of the Eugenodonts got pretty big too. Yeah, later. So, I mean, at the time when Cyvotus was really king, you know, Eugenodonts were tiny little things at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is a bit of a mystery which I'm hoping to, uh, we'll we'll solve soon. Um, so when the last we see the giant Cyvotus is at the end of the late Mississippian period. Then you have this kind of gap between really big tinacants. And this is actually kind of a, a larger project I'm kind of uh, looking into is the evolutionary stages of, of tinacanth, you know, getting big body sizes. So we have a record of a really big one from the Devonian, uh, which was about the size of the Cyvotus stuff we're seeing uh, in the late Mississippian. You have Cyvotus. Um, there's a record of a, a decent sized um Glickmanius type animal from the the late Pennsylvanian, and then you have Kaibab and Nader in the early mid Permian. Um, so there's like at least what four different phases of giant tinacans at one point. Um, mm -hmm. And then yeah, so you have this gap. So where you see the gap is when you when the Eugenodonts, especially with Edestis, were monstrous. Um, Edestis is probably a lot more macro predatory Eugenodon compared to Helicoprion because you do get big worlds of Helicoprion, but I think there's actually a, a ecological shift for Helicoprion uh, when you start seeing it in like uh, the late Pennsylvania Permian, um, and it's been argued that these things are shucking you know ammonoids uh, out of their shells with their dentitions, and that actually probably would work. Um, kind of looking at their teeth, and then looking at the other macro predatory thing because Edestis has a very short time period uh, when it existed as being this huge ma massive macro predator. It was basically the middle Pennsylvanian, and then that was it. It's not to say the whole group of the Edestoids, the, the more predatory Eugenodonts, um, didn't hang around. We have a great uh, example of one coming from uh, uh, the Grand Tetons uh, called the uh, Sinohelicoprion. Misnomer is actually an Edestoid. Um, that it was decent size. It was probably a good predator, but but it wasn't massive like the, some of the big jaws you see or big tooth whorls you see of uh, uh, Edestus um, from the Des Moinesian of uh, the Pennsylvanian or Middle Pennsylvanian. So so I think that's what happened. Is like the Edestoids kind of had their reign real quick, and then they died back, and then the Tinacans took over again, mm -hmm. and that's why they got big later. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So before we wrap this up, I have a couple questions that I want to ask you, one of which being what is your all-time favorite chondrichthian taxa? It could be some prehistoric ratfish. It could be something alive today, just like any one of those. And the second one is what taxa or group do you think um, you would like to see the most work done in your lifetime? Let's see. All right, I'll, I'll answer the first one in two parts. So my favorite fossil, Chondrichthian, I'm biased. I love Dracopristus because that was my baby. Um, and then in terms of extant sharks, I'm a huge fan of things like the benign, uh, like basky sharks and whale sharks. Um, cat sharks are really cool too. So I, I like that kind of grouping of, of uh, Chondrichthians. Um, in terms of more work, um, there's definitely lots to be done in the Paleozoic. A lot of a lot of my Sharky colleagues are doing all kinds of cool stuff, you know, with the Cretaceous, and a lot of everybody's doing lots of Megalodon. It's like, guys, put Megalodon away for a moment. Let's go look at some of these other things that really need some uh, TLC in terms of, you know, um, you know, we need more Paleozoic shark workers, to be honest. There's too many Cenozoic and, and Mesozoic, late Mesozoic shark workers right now. At least in this country so uh come it's like come on come come hang out with me and let's go play with some really old sharks so they're, they're the weird and wonderful ones in my opinion well so. i think the paleozoic stuff is harder it's a lot harder for a lot of people to kind of grasp there's so much diversity with it you have to deal with a lot more micro fossils there's a lot of like histology tests done on them oh yeah but there's you know a what? Lot more gaps yeah but I, I i have the opinion that if we have more people looking you know, we're going to find more, you know, if we get to just get our numbers up in terms of, uh, you know, researchers and things like that, mm -hmm. playing around in the Paleozoic beds and stuff like that. Because there's, again, there's there's a lot of stuff in museum collections that still need to be, like, re-looked at because a lot of the black shale material from, like, uh, you know, Illinois, Indiana, um, they haven't been touched on in decades and uh, except for maybe some bits here and there. But I think if we really went back and started looking at that stuff, who knows what a, some really cool stuff might turn up 
Um, and so we could also use some more people helping out in the Bear Gulch, to be honest. There's two people working on it primarily right now. Um, a lot of them are, are like already, you know, getting ready to retire and or are retired. Um, but we just need more people kind of like or, or finding equivalents to Bear Gulch elsewhere um, to do that stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah, so we just need we just need more people, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. You know the bear gulch specimen I'm looking forward to being described most that anachronistid. Yeah, there's actually there should be at least two species. Whenever that's going to get done, I don't know. I'm just kind of like again just sitting on pins and needles until it gets actually written up because again it wasn't it wasn't my project when I was working on bear gulch stuff with them. So um, And so that specimen that that had the chamatotis, lisgotis and venisotis teeth within the same jaw. That was mentioned in a Grogan and Lund publication, but I back don't in the actually yeah back in the eighties yeah. yeah so Doctor Doctor Lund did actually start kind of like teasing out some of this like information, gave some preliminary sketches and stuff like that. Of course, when you look at those sketches, it's like whoa, an acid trip on on you know drawing this stuff up in a way because they look so weird. Um, but uh, that's the one thing that's actually one of the biggest ones I really wish they would publish soon because I'm finding in Mammoth Cave associations of all three of those dental types approximately to one another when i'm looking at the, these cave passages so it, it would actually lend evidence to that you know argument that saying hey these three taxes of you know tooth-based sharks are actually in the jaws of one animal or um you know different species of animals that have very vari variables you know that would explain some of these species variances that we see in one horizon so and that would be an absurd level of heterodonty in a dentition with those three taxa. Yeah, and it, it it goes back to what uh, both Grogan and Lund taught me is like never never be just like be expecting of unexpected. You know, that's that way. So that's a good example of that. The Paleozoic must have really been some alien world if we if we were teleported there. It must yeah. be crazy. Most of the stuff will kind of look similar, somewhat similar. Like if you we were like, you know, scuba diving, it's like, oh, look, it's a trigger fish. And you're like, oh, wait, no, that's a shark. Never mind. <laughs> it's just basically sharks filled in all the niches that bony fish do today. Yeah. And then the weird ones like the Ineopteryx and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Crazy. Well, it was great having you on, JP. And I look forward to talking with you more and seeing what else you can come up with. Because you're you're more than busy with some new publications in the works. Yeah, we might have to talk again at the end of the year. So sounds good. All right, cool. Take care, JP. Take care, Ben. Thanks.